Hello and welcome back to Talking Europe. I'm at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Its president, Roberta Metsola, is urging the EU to send a strong signal to the Western Balkans at the upcoming summit in Albania in early December. Young people from those countries are hungry for the EU, she says, and the EU should not turn away from them. But as several of those countries sat in the waiting room for years, disillusionment set in. This summer, Albania and North Macedonia did start accession talks, but questions remain as to whether enlargement really is a priority for the EU. Well, to dig into that a bit more, I'm joined by Željana Zofko, a Croatian MEP from the European People's Party. She's vice president of the Delegation for Relations with Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo. Also joining me is Fiola von Karmon, a German MEP from the Group of the Greens and a member of the delegation to the EU-Serbia Stabilization and Association Parliamentary Committee. So, Viola von Kamen, if I could start with you. Uh, you said that the last Balkan summit uh, in June was a complete failure, that it could only have made Vladimir Putin happy. Uh, do you think now that North Macedonia and Albania have started these talks with the EU, that has the EU perhaps woken up in a sense? First of all, that is true. Second of all, we have a resumption of the Berlin process. Uh, recently, we saw all six Western Balkan leaders in Berlin signing uh, a more regional integration, signing individual uh, agreements uh, for improvement of the citizens' um, daily things. But this would already make a difference. Uh, that is the path towards the EU integration. Yes, and I would say there is some hope that we get a more, let's say, successful outcome than last time. Uh, um, Juliana Zovko, how, how optimistic are you about a, a, a better outcome this time in, in Tirana compared to the last summit in June? I'm very optimistic uh, as we don't have uh, much time and the Western Balkan leaders understand that uh, the time is uh, of essence. This is the Kairos moment, as we say in Croatia. It's the moment that you, if you don't catch, will never appear again. I'm pretty sure that uh, they will uh, come to their senses and uh, they will come uh, with also a joint statement and more commitment than before. It, you wrote in a, uh, or rather you told the Sarajevo Times that Bosnia-Herzegovina must not be left to an experiment. Uh, is that for you the top priority for the EU, do you think, its integration of Bosnia-Herzegovina? For me it was, it is and it will be the top priority for Croatia, that's a top uh, peace and security issue, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and you must, I must remind you that uh, Stability Pact and the first conference that made the Balkan, Western Balkan, an issue and the EU enlargement topic was done in Sarajevo in 1999 and then uh, Zagreb summit in 2000 when the Jacques Chirac had the courage to offer this uh, enlargement perspective uh, and Croatia is the one who is always advocating an enlargement perspective for the countries in Western Balkan because that's the only way that uh, we will not have uh, instability exported through this area. We can see all these migration waves that are happening again. We can see instability that is happening in our borders. So enlargement for us is the top issue and Bosnia and Herzegovina is the key issue for the Western Balkan. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get both of your thoughts on uh, Serbia and Kosovo, but perhaps we could start with Serbia, uh, uh, Fiola von Karman. Um, th there was an opinion poll done by uh, the Balkans and Europe Policy Advisory Group a year ago, which showed much lower public support for the EU in Serbia than in the other uh, Western Balkans countries. Do, do you think there's a r real risk of Serbians just sort of giving up on the whole process? No, not at all. I think this is very misleading. Uh, I see that Serbia is a European country, as all the others too. Uh, we see also quite a low, let's say, support uh, amongst the people in Slovakia or Bulgaria when you ask them how much they are in favor of the EU. It's, so it's, Serbia is quite it's a bit different. It's less than 50 percent. It's yeah. less than North Macedonia's and others. That's yeah. for sure. I mean, Kosovo is on the top. Albania is the second. And they are by far uh, the most pro-European, most pro-Western, most pro-NATO. Uh, and, and uh, common foreign uh, security policy uh, supporters, that's for sure. But 
I would say that uh, the policy which which has taken for quite some time uh, blaming the EU uh, for things which do not work in his country or also do not work in the in the dialogue is a bit unfortunate uh, and unfortunately at the moment it's approved uh, by the failure of the um, of the dialogue we are back to the crisis mode but I do hope this is only temporarily I really give a lot of credit to our partners in the US and to our chief um, negotiator and interlocutor, Biroslav Lajczak. All of them do a great job, supported and uh, accompanied by the capitals, working hard on receiving and achieving a solution. And in that, I would also say if we have a successful outcome, yeah. people will trust also in Belgrade uh, into the EU institution and the opinion polls might look different in a year. Um, what are your thoughts on that, on, on Serbia's future? Uh, Serbia's future will be decided by Serbian people. Serbian people must understand that this is also a key moment. I don't think that they are very pro-NATO because they have their uh, issues with NATO, but uh, certainly they are pro-European. Uh, for a long time they've learned how to play on both sides, but uh, sometimes they don't understand that uh, it's, this time is over. And uh, now they have to make, uh, make up their mind, they have to make a right choice, they have to also to deal with the past uh, and uh, to deal with the minorities. Now they're making some, uh, some improvements, but we still have uh, war memories and undiscovered uh, um, uh, destiny of the, and the fate of, of, of the soldiers to, and, uh, and the victims, civilians from the, from the war that we had with the Serbia. But Croatia is ready really to take them on, to help them, to lead them. Just a, on a related question to both of you, um, Kosovo, uh, speaking of unresolved issues from, from the past and from the former Yugoslavia, uh, Kosovo, of course, still not been granted visa liberalization, even though the European Commission said in 2018 that the conditions had been met. Uh, would you argue that this has not been finished for political reasons? How do you see that? Well, this is extremely unfortunate. I mean, not that the Commission has uh, given green light in 2018. There was a revised report recently which has praised Kosovo, um, I mean, in all the reforms, 100 and 120 percent. I mean, this is absolutely positive. So there is no need for any capital, for any of, uh, let's say, the reluctance in the, uh, in the member states. But for political reasons, for purely domestic reasons, and I don't want to single them out, yeah. we still face a lot of obstacles. And when you think you have settled them, the next member states comes around the corner with the next obstacle. And that does not help us in the dialogue. That does not help us in the negotiation when we try to normalize the relation between Serbia and Kosovo. So I call on all the leaders in the European member states to grant visa lib to Kosovo immediately, because otherwise we will um, well, we have to have, or we face uh, obstacles in the in the negotiations. W would you echo that call or not? I'm very much pro-liberalization, but unfortunately Kosovo is a hostage of the bad reputation of some other countries that abuse this system and also of uh, the lack of the uh, willingness from their leadership to agree between Belgrade and Pristina on, on this dialogue. Uh, as I, I think that's a sign of the improvement and the uh, some solutions that could be found on this in this dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina can be awarded as well with uh, visa liberalization for its citizens. So sometimes uh, they should play a bit uh, better this uh, dialogue. Right. Let, let's just zoom out. Uh, we're, we're sort of coming to, to almost to, to the end of the show. But um, I'm just curious about your thoughts on the French president's shift away from the Europe or seemingly from the European political community. Now he seems to be supporting uh, Albania and North Macedonia much more. He sent one of his top officials uh, for a visit to say, yes, we back your entry into the EU. Do you think he's kind of muddied the waters unnecessarily, caused some kind of um, harmful ambiguity in this? Well, what I see is that President Macron's intention was to create something where when you see the geopolitical threat coming from Russia, from China, from other third actors, it is good to have a platform where you can integrate 
uh, and uh, welcome all the European countries without uh, distinction of membership or not. Saying this, I think he fully understood as a geopolitical thinker that for stability and peace on our continent, we need to integrate the six Western Balkan states at a point. And for that, we need to send them an honest offer. And of course, that also means that France should welcome the uh, opening of the negotiation talks with Albania and, and, and North Macedonia. And I'm just, very happy that it happened. Just, just a very quick response from you on, on France's, uh, France's role in all of this. What do you think? Yeah, France is coming back. And uh, President Macron obviously understood that in order to uh, promote this strategic autonomy, he needs to have a strategic security and uh, enlargement and Western Balkan countries. The idea that President Chirac has started now it's coming back. So Western Balkan uh, countries, the, uh, security, peace and stability is coming from there. If you don't take it on as a, your own responsibility, enlargement is a, is a tool. It's the only tool that how we can protect our borders. There's no other better tool for that. So he, he uh, he's now uh, has this institutional memory. And obviously, um, I would also welcome uh, Katrin Colonna, who was really working hard on this issue as a minister of foreign affairs she's a, she was a, she was a really good uh, minister and uh, she's a, she's a great asset on this issue and i had the pleasure to know president Chirac at the time when he was starting this idea so i welcome france uh, with a new role and with a new responsibility and um, finally it's the only nuclear power that we have in europe so it takes a it takes uh, France to assume, assume its responsibility on uh, security and stability on all our borders, and that's the enlargement. Okay, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much to my guests, Juliana Zovko and Viola von Carmon. And that brings us to the end of this edition of Talking Europe. Thanks for watching.